Hi, I'm Dr. Tala and I've been a neonatologist for 17 years now and today it's a quick video. We're going to cover the effects on the fetus of some common maternal pregnancy issues. Four common maternal pregnancy issues. One, let's start with diabetes. So the first thing that I want to say is realize that the diabetes in a pregnant mother may be present during gestation and it just started during the pregnancy. Normally that's diagnosed in the second trimester or the mother already had diabetes before she even got pregnant. If the mother had diabetes and therefore abnormal sugars before she got pregnant, then that baby was at increased risk of being exposed to high sugars during that first trimester. Now realize that first trimester is when all the organs and systems are actually being formed and glucose in high quantities is embryotoxic. So if the mother had pregestational diabetes, then these babies are at increased risk of actually having congenital malformations. Things like cardiac issues, like a VSD, ASD, a TGA, transposition of the great arteries, or neural issues like a spinal cord defect, or even like an anencephaly, or a very rare outcome, the caudal regression syndrome. Generally, gestational diabetes is diagnosed in the second trimester. But these babies are also at increased risk of things, just those issues are more transient. So whether the mothers had pregestational or gestational diabetes, these are what the babies are at increased risk of. Generally, these babies are a lot bigger, so they're often LGA, or large for gestational age, above 90th percentile for their birth weight. These babies are therefore a lot more likely to be delivered by C-section, just because we're worried that they won't be able to be delivered vaginally. Because they're so big, they sometimes actually get stuck during delivery, so they do have an increased risk of hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, or HIE, and also logically they have an increased risk of having some sort of birth trauma. So whether that's like a fracture, a clavicular fracture, or whether they've got like shoulder dystocia and like an herbs palsy or a clumpkeys paralysis or something. These babies are at higher risk of respiratory issues, increased risk of TTN, transient tachypnea of the newborn, increased risk of respiratory distress syndrome. Those are like the huge 37 weekers that somehow still need surfactant. Also, this isn't respiratory, but they normally present with respiratory issues. They're at increased risk of having cardiac myopathy, or really it's a septal hypertrophy. Again, these are all transient. We just have to wait long enough. Often these babies are admitted to the NICU because of their hypoglycemia. All IDM babies are at increased risk of hypoglycemia. They're also at increased risk of hypocalcemia and hypomagnesemia. So remember, if a baby is jittery, check the glucose, but also check the calcium, especially in an IDM baby. Number two, let's talk about pregnancy-induced hypertension. This is kind of on a spectrum with preeclampsia and eclampsia. Obviously, they can be extremely dangerous to both the mother and the fetus if left untreated. High morbidity, high mortalities. So sometimes the preeclampsia is so dangerous to the mother that they are absolutely forced to deliver a baby. So by definition, these babies are a lot more likely to be born prematurely by delivering by C-section or whatever. And because the placenta in this disease process is not functioning very well, they're normally small and they're not good at giving the nutrition and the oxygen that the babies need, these babies often end up being SGA, or small for gestational age. Premature babies who are born SGA are at increased risk of mortality as well as many morbidities, including BPD, ROP, neck, pulmonary hemorrhages, late onset sepsis, further neurodevelopmental delays. So it's not a minor thing. Both preemie and term babies that are born to mothers with PIH, especially if their placenta was small or whatever, are at increased risk of having an abnormal CBC. Most commonly, their hematocrit will be on the higher side and then their other blood cells will be slightly depressed. So generally, these babies will have a slightly lower platelet count, less than 150,000, and lower WBC count, less than 5,000, and low ANC, absolute neutrophil count, less than 5,000. Three, PPROM or preterm premature rupture of membranes, when the mother's water just breaks and the membranes just rupture prematurely, usually by definition less than 37 weeks. In this case, there are three major things that we're worried about. The first one, obviously, is preterm delivery. Even if the mother isn't in actual labor when the water breaks, the chances of her going into labor obviously increases greatly. And most mothers that have rupture of membranes are gonna deliver in three to four weeks. Latency antibiotics can make that a little bit 
better, but if a mother's ruptured, there's a much higher chance of a preterm delivery and with all the morbidities that are associated with that. Two, if the membranes have ruptured, then obviously there is no longer protection from the outside world. So there's a higher chance that there can be an ascending infection that can get into the amniotic sac and infect the fluid as well as the placenta and therefore the baby. So this is what we call chorioamnionitis. And if there's been PPROM, there's a much higher incidence of chorioamnionitis. If the mother develops that, then the baby basically will want to deliver itself, but the baby needs to come out, otherwise won't make it in utero. And the third thing we worry about, which honestly I don't think we talk about as much with the PPROMs, is the pulmonary hypoplasia. With less amniotic fluid or maybe zero amniotic fluid in the amniotic sac, there's literally no fluid in the lungs to help the lungs grow. And very often, if there's little or no amniotic fluid, these lungs don't grow at all. They're very small, they're fixed, they don't have the blood supply that they need. So these babies are born and it's almost impossible to oxygenate and ventilate them. We try putting in chest tubes and put them on the oscillator and put them on nitric and often they don't make it anyway. Obviously, that's kind of the worst end of the spectrum. The how good the lungs are will depend on how much fluid there is in the amniotic sac and how long the baby's been exposed to low fluids for. But generally, when we do prenatal consults to mothers with PPROM, we emphasize that the most. We can deal with a choreo. I mean, we don't like it, but we can deal with it. We can deal with prematurity, but there's almost nothing that we can do if there's really bad pulmonary hyperplasia. Four, maternal anxiety or depression during pregnancy. Again, something very common. A lot of mothers experience this. As you can imagine, untreated depression is very bad for the, both the mothers and the babies. For the babies, there's a much higher risk of preterm delivery, as well as the babies being born SGA. For the mothers, there's an increased chance of getting readmitted to the hospital, increased risk of preeclampsia, increased risk of suicidality, as well as postpartum depression. So basically, maternal depression should not go untreated. Different antidepressants and anti-anxiety medications have been blamed for causing congenital malformations. Honestly, it's not very convincing data, and if there is an increased risk of congenital malformations, it's a very small amount, like maybe 1.1 times the risk. Things like slight increased risk of, con of congenital heart malformations, for example, VSD, ASD, a coarctation, gut anomalies, for example, gastroschisis. Definitely not enough increased risk to stop the mothers from taking these medications. We do need to be aware of some newborn symptoms that can occur if babies have been exposed to any of these medications in utero. And they kind of fall into two groups. The first one is more of a withdrawal group. So for example, if the mother was on benzodiazepines and then the baby is no longer getting them, then baby may have withdrawal symptoms like irritability, crying a lot, poor feeds, poor sleeping, poor weight gain and jitteriness. And if necessary, then we do have to start benzos in these babies and then slowly wean them off. The other group of symptoms you need to be aware about are respiratory symptoms from some of these SSRIs. So fluoxetine and sertraline. Some of these babies after they're born can develop some difficulties breathing. It can be more of like a PPHN, so a persistent pulmonary hypertension type picture. So you're just kind of wondering why this baby might need so much oxygen. Go back and look at the maternal history. Or it could be just kind of more like of a TTN picture where they just need a little bit of respiratory support. Either way, this is reversible. We just need to give them the respiratory support before they're over it. And all of these babies can have kind of slightly worse feeds and maybe a little bit of hypoglycemia from that. So with any concerns, make sure that you check a sugar level. Again, this is transient. I hope that was helpful. Like this video if you got this far and please subscribe if you want access to more neonatal education.